Well, let me start this town hall by just welcoming everybody who has signed on. We really appreciate it. Our whole Rutgers Newark team is here. Our great partner, Tony Calcato, executive vice president is here. And we really want to thank people for sending in a whole stream of very thoughtful questions, which we will try to get to um, today. And um, let me reiterate what I said last week in my message, which is let's do a special round of thanks to all those people who actually have been here all along, who've worked through the pandemic on from the beginning to keep us and get us to the point we're at. So I just want to say a heartfelt thanks. And I know everybody, all 500 people in this town hall um, really embraced the people who kept this going and gotten us to this point. And what is this point? It's a very complicated dynamic point, but we are coming back here and we are coming back together. So today we really wanna address very important concerns and yet also be clear that this is a flexible dynamic situation as we all know. Um, so I'm going to turn immediately then to Candace Joseph, our great um, Director of Human Resources at Newark um, to get us started. And again, big thanks um, from the whole Rutgers Newark leadership team um, to everybody who's pitching in to make things work. Candace. Thank you, Nancy. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome, welcome. I have the honor of introducing our special guest today. Before we do that, just wanted to make a note that this session is being recorded. So we do have all of you. The session is being recorded, so for anyone who's just joining, you'll be able to hear all of Nancy's welcomes and the entire presentation. Alrighty, we will go through a few categories of questions, but we have with us today Executive Vice President of Strategic Planning and Operations and our Chief Operating Officer here at Rutgers University, Tony Calcado. Thank you very much for joining us. The floor is yours. After 18 months, you'd think I'd be able to find that mute button without a problem, but unfortunately that's not the case. So let me first say thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, to, the, to, to the team um, here on the North campus, to Chancellor Cantor, um, who has always been phenomenally supportive of um, not just me, but of her students and of her staff. And I can tell you, we work very, very, very closely together on a regular basis. And I know how much she cares and I know how invested she is in the health and safety of all that return as we begin our return, right? So all of our campuses are nuanced or all a little bit different. Um, uh, and this, uh, but one thing all of us have undergone, this has been a long haul affecting our lives, right? This pandemic has uh, affected us physically. We know of people and everybody, I think everybody in the Northeast knows of someone else who is either ill or um, who may even have passed and way too many of you know way too many of those individuals as well. The other thing that this has affected is our mental health and it's taken a real toll on, on how we act now. Um, on what we are concerned with, what we are not concerned with. It, it is um, difficult sometimes to even move forward because there are so many pressures that are not physical related to the things that we do on a regular basis, right? Whether we're coming to work, whether we're going to a restaurant, whether we're going to, to, to a, a supermarket, a performance and you know all these things are in the back of your mind as to how do what do I do am I supposed to wear a mask what am I doing here how am I going to do this am I am, do I feel safe enough so um and I understand that I understand that really well I've been at this now um since January of 2020 with global and study abroad students and um and it feels like this has been my entire life I've had um I've experienced COVID from both sides, 
from um, having contracted it and um, of course from having to deal with it regularly on a regular basis, everyday basis. So what most people don't know is after all those fancy titles you, that Candace went through, um, one of my jobs is the emergency management coordinator for the university. And that's what landed me in this job of being the coordinator for the, our response to COVID-19. I never thought in January, February, in March, that in August of 2021, I would still be doing this job. And it is my, it will be the greatest pleasure of my job when I relinquish this from a daily, um, from a daily job. So anyway, we've, um, we here at Rutgers have taken a very go slow approach. And, and that is a testament to people like Chancellor Cantor and her team who have always lobbied for making sure that we do what's right before uh, we look at any other situation affecting the university. And by that, I mean, you know, we're not rushing through because there's revenues that are lost or we're not rushing through because there's some optic that would look better, none of that. So we've always stayed away from that. We've always looked at at a go slow approach, letting the science lead us every single step of the way. So while you look around and almost all the institutions in the state of New Jersey reopened, and I call it reopening because it's, it's, it's it more effectively repopulated. For them, it was reopening. We've always been open. They all did it in the fall of 2020. And we thought, no, that that's not, that's not going to work. We're not going to bring people back in, into an environment that we can't guarantee to some degree that they will have a comfort level in being back. So we've let the science lead us and take us where we thought the best decisions can be made. I could tell you that Nancy and I talked about the fall of 20, the summer of 20, the fall of 20, the spring of 20, the summer of 21, spring of 21, summer of 21. But we were confident enough now um, to be able to pull this trigger. And so people say, well, what changed from last year, right? We see Delta variant is, is just running wild. Um, what changed is vaccine. Vaccine made all of the difference. Even when we look at the Delta variant, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes, but when we look at the Delta variant, we look at, um, a, it is ultimately, a pandemic of the unvaccinated at this point. My uh, good friend, Dr. Shah says, you know, the first go around was a pandemic of the immunocompromised, of mostly the elderly, although I don't know how I got it, but of mostly the elderly. Um, but those were the key populations. Now it is a pandemic of the unvaccinated. And that is creating an enormous pressure and stress on the entire system, whether you are vaccinated or not. So vaccinated individuals, you know, there's still a 99% rate of where at best it, it feels like a cold, thankfully, um, if, you, if there's a breakthrough infection, but it does not lead for the most part, 99% of the time to a hospitalization and God forbid death. So that is the game changer. And, and that's also why we chose early on when there was the ability to require that all of our students be vaccinated coming back into the fall 21 semester. We have no regrets about that because we feel that there are a couple of issues that get touched on versus what our faculty and staff or where they stand. So number one, we know what students do on a daily basis. They congregate. They're at an, that it's an age cohort that we're, God bless them. I mean, they are experiencing college, they're experiencing life. They're doing those things that they should be doing in that age group. We feel that not only are we protecting our entire community by having them vaccinated in fall of 21, but we also feel that we're helping them. We are keeping them safe. When it comes to faculty and staff, it's our expectation that they do or you do what is right. You know that you have families at home. You know, you see what the science does and what it says. You see what the efficacy rate is. But I understand that some people 
may not feel either comfortable or for some other reason feel that they should not get the vaccination. It's understandable, but what we want to do is, is educate you, work with you, make sure you understand where you are, and please make sure you understand what it is that you have at home when you go home, because you're at home longer than you are at work. And what we're trying to do is build a safe community outside of Rutgers as well, a safe community in New Jersey and a safe community in the tri-state area. We went through hell. We went through hell. And sometimes we seem to forget the hell that we went through over a year and a half ago. So um, while we are not requiring it, we are very happy with the rates that are coming back from um, our faculty and staff. Our colleagues at better than 82% of having uploaded their vaccination cards. Uh, that's, that's thrilling. That's, that's, a better, that's a better rate than, than the state of New Jersey and, and it doesn't even compare with the nation. So we are doing the right thing. So let me pivot here and talk about what are we doing as we come back and, and um, what are some of the mitigating strategies that we are putting in place. So you know about mandating vaccine for students. Sometimes there's uh, some forget that we've also mandated actually vaccine for about 8,600 of our colleagues as well. Those are front facing, front facing, um, patient facing individuals. Involved in those, for instance, are all of our public safety division has been mandated to be inoculated because there's a lot of interaction with them across the campus as well. We continue to look at this, but as our numbers rise, we, we feel good about where it is that we are. Um, I should also say that uh, the, the AAUP AFT regular faculty, we're at a 97% rate. I don't know how we get much better than the 97% rate. The number of individuals is under 100 that have not uploaded a card. It doesn't even mean that they're not vaccinated. And some of those could be on things like sabbatical or family leave or those types of issues. And we're climbing, combing through the data to see where we are. We're mandating that we have masking in place indoors for the fall, at least the beginning of the fall. I'm gonna come back and talk to about that a little bit. We're mandating in non-academic spaces, social distancing. And of course, we're mandating that the individuals who have not uploaded a card um, undergo weekly testing, whether you're on a remote schedule or you are not. So all of these things are put in place as mitigating strategies in order to, to try and uh, be able to create a safe environment for all of us to come back to. And we always have to look at, and, and, and here's where sometimes there's a little bit of a failure. We look at the balance between safety and comfort. So I'll give you an example. Um, you are AFT recently at a, at a health and safety meeting. So uh, Vivian Fernandez and I meet with uh, a coalition of unions at a health and safety committee meeting made up of labor uh, every Thursday at 2 p.m. I just left that meeting. And one of the requests they had was, as all of you know, you, you, it's required to wear um, masks to mask face covering in an office setting, but you can remove it if you're in a cubicle or an office, private office, but in a cubicle, understanding that people are further than six feet away from you covers just about all of our areas. Um, Yore had asked if we'd revisit that and mandate that, that people wear that face covering in the cubicle setting. I have personally somewhat of an issue with that because someone sitting in a cubicle wearing a face covering for eight hours seems to be difficult to do. All of us have worn face coverings, we still do. That's difficult. It's difficult to ask someone to do it. We don't really see a safety reason to do it, but certainly there's a comfort reason not to do it. So, so we are continuing to look at that. We continue to study that, but we do this with, with many different types of uh, situations that come up. We look at, you know, do we expand testing? Do we not expand testing? We look at what the science says about testing. We've gotten questions about, you know, we should be testing everybody. Fair point. Unfortunately, it, that is not recommended by the science. It's not recommended by public health or the CDC. So therefore we're not doing it at this point. It does not mean that we do not continue to look at that as we move forward. 
we continue to try and understand where the virus is going and, and who is being affected by the virus and at what point. So we continue to study those pieces as we move forward. This in the end is a shared responsibility amongst all of us. And, and we will continue to work with you to get feedback as to where your comfort level is, where you wanna be, what you understand to be an issue. There's lots of misinformation out on the internet. There's lots of misinformation that gets passed from person to person. I'm gonna go back to the Delta variant and exactly who that really is affecting. And many times if you turn your local news on or you turn your national news on, depending on who's providing that news, it sounds like everyone now is coming down with the Delta variant and you know going down for the count, so to speak, when in fact, that's not really the case. I need to, to make sure that everybody understands that we will have cases. Even with the mitigation strategies we have in place, there will be cases. We know that. You know that. You know of cases personally that have happened in places that you've been, potentially family members you're with. We will have cases. We have a good team in place to be able to address that when it happens. We have an active case today that we're, we're looking at on the North Campus to understand how far did this go? What needs to happen? Contact tracers look at that. We, we understand that. There's, there's no hiding this or putting this, sweeping this under the rug. We know that this will happen. I expect we'll have many more. I expect when students start to move in on Saturday, we'll see an uptick in cases. There's no doubt about that. Um, so what we can't do is run from that because we do have strategies we put in place. We, we know how to notify people. We know how to contact trace. They, these are our contact tracers. These are individuals that work for us. So we'll continue to work through those strategies. We'll use, again, what public health tells us, what CDC tells us, what the Department of Health tells us in New Jersey. And we keep employing all of those strategies as we move forward. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the top three questions I think um, I get all the time. The first one is HVAC. What are we doing? What has happened in the buildings? What's going on? We have a robust preventative maintenance program at the university. We have accomplished um, over the course of the last year and a half, something on the order of 28,000 preventative maintenance work. Orders. So what does that mean? We go into every system to accurate, to make sure it's working the way it was designed to work and whatever improvements we could potentially make to that system, we do. So can we go from a regular filter to a MERV 13? If we can, we do it. That's not always possible to do. Lots of talk about HEPA filters. HEPA filters stop air. The systems that are not built for HEPA filters cannot employ HEPA filters. So we do improve them where we can without restricting the airflow that goes through a system. We do this on a regular basis. We've done it a number of times as we've run through. We've increased on our outside air where we're allowed to. And again, we need to be careful. Day like today, where it must be 90 or 95% humidity. If we increase our outside air, the walls will start to, to literally sweat. There will be water on the floor. So it's a balancing act, much like comfort. It's also a balancing act as to what we do within our systems. I know that there are people who talk about, well, this building or that building, there, you know, there's always been air quality issues. In fact, all of our buildings are up to the indoor air quality standard. Now, older buildings, of course, a little different, and they'll always act a little different and be a little different than our new buildings newer buildings there's just that's that's just a fact of life i'll also say and, and i think this is a good place for that is that um you know hvac when we talk about uh, increasing outside air and you hear a lot about that you know more volume we need more air and because it's more air changes well when you're at for instance a 50 percent occupancy in an office environment you've already increased the air by 50 percent so we can't lose sight of those types of of uh incidences that happen and that we've incorporated into, um, into making sure that our systems are working well. Will there be breakdowns? There will. 
Those are simply a phone call to the local, to the facilities department. We will get on those decisions made about whether that building should be filled that day. That, that'll depend on what that situation is. If it's an extended breakdown, no, of course. And we work with individuals at, um, that, are, or that are in the buildings to understand what the problem is and what it is that we need to do with them. So we have done an enormous amount of work on HVAC. I would, I would implore you to go onto the COVID-19 website. It is laid out there. It's got all of the work that's been happening, how we align with CDC and public health guidelines. I think that's important for everyone to understand how that happens. We will be taking another look at that, that section, HVAC section to try and push out some more information to you that might be a little bit more granular as we move forward. Another question I get is, um, um, accommodations. So there is a system to work through for accommodations. It should start at the local level, always, right? Your immediate supervisor, uh, manager, having that conversation, trying to understand what the issue is and seeing what can be done right there as it happens. It can be escalated on the faculty side, of course, you know, working with a chair and then if necessary, a dean, and it can be escalated all the way up. More granular information, it's a call to UHR's one source can help um, work our way uh, through that as well. Remember that accommodations um, are really dependent on, uh, not every accommodation is, yes, you can work from home. Many times there are different options and those are the things that we would look at and what works best both for the university and for the individual. Um, I want to touch a little bit on, because I kind of slashed this one, might be four questions, but I'm going to call it three questions. Um, the future, and this is, I think, a good place to talk about that a little bit. What does the future working at the university look like? We've talked extensively. The president has, has put out um, correspondence messaging to this, and I know Chancellor Cantor has put out correspondence and, and messages to this point, right? Universities are built to be in person. That's the nature of our business. Our work is to support our students. It's to support our patients where we have them. It's to support our research and is to support those communities that we are in. That's our work and we do that work in person. Universities, unlike many corporate entities, are not built to work from home. So I'm gonna pivot a little bit here. I get two observations or questions all the time. I've been doing this for a year and a half from home and I am more productive being at home than when I come in. So nothing will make an executive vice president's head explode faster than that comment, right? So what were you doing at work? But I digress. In reality, we don't know how to measure that. Maybe very true. It may be very true, but we don't know how to measure that. The second comment I get all the time, my days have never been longer than they are now. I start at seven in the morning and I keep going on Zooms until seven or eight o'clock at night. I've never worked so hard in my life. Again, we don't want you working from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. I'm going to go back to the first thing I said, mental health, right? We don't want that. We have no interest. The university has no interest whatsoever in your working those hours. The problem on both those questions is that we have no infrastructure in place. So we pivoted. We went home. I remember working with Chancellor Cancer to to come up with a thousand laptops or something along those and get them that day in March 17th because we have no infrastructure built out. To that end though, there are lessons that are learned here and we know that and we understand that, you know, the future is not gonna look like the past. 10 years down the road, people are still gonna be talking about the pandemic and that's hoping that we're not coexisting with the pandemic. So, uh, the president has charged Vivian Fernandez with a task force that will look at every aspect of this. 
they, there will be a lot of information gathering. There will be town halls. All of those things will be put in place, working groups. You'll hear a lot more of it so that they can make recommendations to um, the university's leadership, including Chancellor Cantor, somewhere, I think, Nancy, in May or June, I, I don't remember exactly, um, in order to see to, to move forward for the following year. Again, with an infrastructure, these things are doable. Without an infrastructure, we're just flailing. And both sides of that. Yes, you may be much more productive. And yes, you may be working way more than you should be working. And we want to make sure that that's not the case. The last question I get is, what are you doing um, additionally now with because of the Delta variant? So we talked a little bit about, in reality, who the Delta variant affects. But we also know that there are breakthrough cases. Um, it's not what we are doing additionally, it's what we have decided not to pull back on. So I will tell you in confidence of the five or 600 people that are here, um, one of the things that we were looking at was if, if we had continued down the path we were was to eliminate the mask mandate, except for those people that felt comfortable wearing it. Another was to eliminate social distancing in our office environments. Um, another was to eliminate our testing. And because of the Delta variant, we've pulled back on all of those strategies and said, no, we're not gonna do that. We're gonna keep these in place. We'll follow where this goes. When the time is appropriate, we will revisit the elimination of those. In addition, we continue to look at, do we need to add anything more as we move forward? So um, we make these decisions, I can tell you, um, on an everyday basis. There was a time when the chancellor and I spoke every day, every day. It's not, um, there is no lack of transparency. There's nothing that I have to hide from any of you. We are where we are because the forces of nature have put us here. What I can commit to you is that uh, we will continue to work together to bring us back as safely as we possibly can, understanding that all of us have a role in that safety. And, and, and I'm going to answer a, a, a question I know that will come up. You know, who enforces that safety? Who enforces mask mandates and, and who enforces social distancing? We all do. There are no mask police. There are no social distancing police. We all do. These are the types of situations that literally self-correct. Someone's not wearing a mask indoors. It's simply, please put your mask on. Do not, do not get into a situation where that escalates. Just pull back, understand, know the surroundings. If the person decides not to, there's a COVID observation form online. Please fill it out. We will follow up to understand what this problem was. With students, we have the same issue. We can run right up to, you know, going to the code of conduct in a classroom. Student doesn't put it on. The instructor has every right and every ability to require that student to put it on. So we ask um, that we all be part of this solution. We're not going to get away from COVID. We are not going to get away. We're asking you to be part of the solution as we move forward. Um, I think I will leave it there because I want my friend Sherry Ann Butterfield to answer questions as well. So thank you and thank you for giving me the opportunity and uh, please, please be safe. Thank you very much, Tony. We have received over a hundred questions and I was here just running lines through them. You have covered probably 30% of the questions. So thank you very much for that. I think at this point, we want to pivot to address some more specific questions so that we can uh, have the panelists focus on these for us. If time permits, we will address all of the questions that are presented in the questions and answers that have been shared live. Thank you for all of you who are sharing those. Uh, as I said, we received over a hundred questions prior to um, the commencement of today's session. So my first question, ABC Butterfield, this one is for you. Let me make sure I unmute you. There we go. Okay. All right. 
So the first question, do we have any indication of how our students feel about repopulating the classrooms? Do we? Yes, we do. But before I start one, I just want to thank Tony again. I want to thank Nancy as well. The two of them have been in lockstep with the president and the senior team for the past 18 months. And I, I don't know where we'd be without them. So I just want to thank them both publicly and thank all of you um, for hanging in there with us. Um, in reference to the question about how our students are doing, so they're super excited about being back here. Now, I'm not saying that's every student. Let's be clear. There are some who have some anxieties and some concerns and They've asked questions, similar questions to the ones that Tony just finished answering, and they have some other ones that we'll hopefully we'll get to later. But by and large, our students are super excited to, to be back on campus in person. Many of them talked about while they did, you know, they learned some things um, learning remotely, they learn better in person. And so they really are, are excited to see their faculty, they're excited to see their advisors, they're excited to see their colleagues. And you know, we, we're mostly commuter campus, but our students see this as home for them, whether they live here or not. And so we've gotten that on multiple occasions. And again, I'm not saying it's, it's everyone, but that is definitely the sense that there's been. And so I also wanted to invite Dr. Corlys Thomas, um, Vice Chancellor of Student Affairs to talk to, because I'm thinking about what's gonna happen in the classroom. She's also getting it from the Student Affairs side. So Corlys. Absolutely, thank you, Sherri Ann. Um, I would just say, yes, our students miss their classes. They miss their faculty, their colleagues. They miss their friends. Um, and that's what we've heard from our students. A, a big part of being a part of the Rutgers Newark community is our community. And our students have shared with us that they want to be back on campus. They want to engage in student life um, activities and student leadership activities. And so I would say from the student life and student affairs perspective, um, we've heard equal excitement. Of course, there's always going to be that student with some concern, um, and we're ready and prepared to, to address those concerns. But for the most part, we have heard from our students that they're ready um, to rejoin uh, their friends here on campus. Beautiful. Thank you both. Thank you both. And just before you go to the next thing, I just want to also remind the students know this, but I want to remind us, we have two classes of students who haven't been here yet. And so we have an, a larger, larger amount of people who are excited to be back here. And so I think that's important for us to remember that it's not just our entering class, it's last year's entering class as well. And so there are many more people who are equally excited about coming back. Thanks. Thank you. Bill, next question for you, please. For new students, what plans are in place? to set these students up with their IDs and to familiarize them with the facilities that we have on campus. As Sherry had mentioned, a few of them haven't been here before. So um, I would say that IDs are important to all of our students. There are returning students who may have lost their ID, their ID may have been damaged. Um, and so it's an ID service kind of perspective for all of our students as well as all of our faculty and staff. So with a number of, but the, let's talk about the last two years. So last two years, we have continued to have SOAR or our Student Advising and Orientation Program. Um, and with that, during that process, students are reminded to upload their picture um, for the photo ID process. And even though we were not in person, we were actually mailing IDs to students to their home addresses. If their home address had changed because they may have relocated, as we understood, some folks needed to relocate, we did that with updates of the students. And so um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pop in really quickly, if I may, um, a link where students can go if they're having questions about IDs. Um, but every student who's, who's working with us um, in that space, we, 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 we are uploading IDs and we are sending to them to them. So you're like, so what happens if I'm an undergraduate student who did not have the opportunity to, to go to SOAR, but I am registered for classes? For each one of those students, in the next week, we are downloading all their names, uploading all their IDs and reaching out to them and starting to send those items out. So we wanna make sure that students are receiving those IDs. There will be a number of students who will arrive on campus who will not be registered. Um, as we have done before, it may be an orientation for a graduate program, it may be an orientation for a special program. Our ID team is working very closely with those folks as we have done before the pandemic to ensure that we can have those students upload their pictures. We will then print those IDs in bulk and bring them to the location of where I, 
orientation may be happening or an event may be happening. If we can't do that, we again will send them by, we again will send them by um, US mail or snail mail. We also will have a distribution center over in the parking lot of Blumenthal during the first two weeks of class. So folks who have not been able to do that will also be able to upload their ID, come over and be able to pick that up. So we are working to ensure that we can work with students to get them their IDs. We know that's really, really important. Um, we have understood from our student affairs colleagues, as well as us, that um, an ID matters to a student because it says that they are part of our community. So over the course of not being in person, students had one of those IDs so that they knew that they were going to be important upon return. If you are a faculty or staff member and it's ID services, ID services, we have been working very closely with our colleagues down in University of Human Resources in New Brunswick. You would go to the, um, the one source portal. And in the one source portal, we, you can say that you're uploading, you can say that you need an ID. Again, everybody would upload their ID to the photo submission. So the photo submission process, I'm putting in an email for Candace to post. Every photo ID gets uploaded this way, whether it's faculty or staff. Um, you have to stand behind a white or clear background, take a help selfie similar to what you see shoulders and above. It then gets uploaded to the system and then they're able to do that. Um, for faculty and staff, UHR takes the lead in mailing that to their permanent mailing address to be able to do that. If there is an emergency on campus, and we've had some where folks' um, ID stopped working for some reason, we've been able to make appointments to one off those to be able to get those to folks as we need. So we're trying to do as much as we can before school starts. And once school begins, we'll have um, a much easier kind of access downstairs in the parking lot for folks to pick up. We think it was important to be able to streamline that and to make that happen during the first two weeks. So we are doing those areas. And again, if program directors, schools have questions about their students getting IDs, um, you can email myself or Roseanne and we will work with you to be able to do that. I recognize tons of folks' names on, 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 on our, and our thing today. And I'm so excited that you're all joining us. I can't wait to see you in person again. Um, so I don't have to, so I can, you know, it's actually strange seeing people on campus for the first time in person um, in a good way. It's like, it's like being at the beginning of school all over again. Um, so, you know, we're excited when we see folks on campus. So we are here to help you. We are here to streamline that. And we are here that can hopefully be easily accessible for you. But again, you know, work with us, but we're already in that process of doing that through our orientation programs, orientation directors, and then faculty and staff, you are going to be working with either HR Newark and or the person in your school or your administrative area to be able to upload those items into the one source portal and then be able to get those mailed home. So I, I think that answers the majority of the questions around that. Yes, you did. Thank you very much, Bill. I really like that you said the ID makes you a part of the community because we do have a, our students who are going to be moving on to campus for the very first time. So, Police, I have a question that I would like to present to you. Can parents come to moving day and help set up the dorms with the students? Yes, um, so moving is a super exciting time for us every year and absolutely we are, um, the short answer to the question is yes, we are allowing uh, two uh, folks to help each student move into their residence hall rooms. Um, we do ask, um, so let me just give a few details about moving. First, we have um, um, distributed mo moving out over uh, the course of several days, um, and that is to maintain health and safety. We don't want everybody coming on the same day at the same time, and so we've given people windows of time, and we've given uh, specific days for people to move in. Um, we're asking that everyone who comes in to move in is masked and that they remain masked through the entire move-in process. Um, I wanna give a shout out to our Residence Life staff who has been here since March of 2020, just doing amazing, amazing work um, every single day, all day long. Um, and they will be here on move-in helping um, as well. Um, we're asking that folks maintain social distancing. I wanna remind folks that as um, uh, Executive Vice President Cal Cato pointed out that we are the keepers of the standard around um, maintaining social distancing and maintaining masking. So please um, let's uh, encourage each other um, to do those things. Um, we will have some uh, limited uh, 
uh, trucks and dollies to help on that day. We will have students that are everywhere, our student staff that are helping as well. So yes, two folks are allowed. Um, we're also asking if you're not feeling well on that day, please do not join us on that day um, for move in, but um, do your goodbyes at home uh, and uh, send your student off and we will assist on this end um, with the move-in um, because we wanna make sure that everyone who is here, that we're not having anyone that's a part of the group that is not well. Um, so that's kind of the short story on move-in. Everyone that is at this point slated to move-in has received all of that information that I just shared um, and um, all of the move-in information in terms of where they're going to be, et cetera, et cetera, um, as of now. Thank you very much, Collins. Thank you. Next question, Amber, if you can address this for us, please. Right now, a few of our buildings are card access only. Will this be remain in space in place when the semester begins? Uh, thank you, Candace. So we will actually be returning the building operating status to our pre-COVID operating hours. So the buildings will not be card access only from the normal operating hours, which average around 9 to 4, uh, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. in most buildings, I'm swiping card access on the weekends and after hours. So we'll be going back to those operating status when school, when the, when the term opens. Thank you, thank you, Amber. We have a, a question, John, I think you'll be best suited to address this for us. Is there a syllabus template which includes language regarding classroom policies, such as wearing a mask and the steps an instructor should take should a student not comply with the mask requirement? Thank you, Candice. So um, we are in the very final stages of uh, finalizing the language and we will be uh, sending uh, language for that to the deans. Um, we have recently sent our uh, uh, Vice Chancellor Thomas has been uh, drafting some uh, language um, on accommodations and student support. It's, it's language that, that uh, she shares with the, uh, with the schools every uh, every semester and, and she's updated that um, and that's been sent out already the uh, the language on the, uh, the 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 masking policies and the like is as I say it's in the final stage of revision we want to be consistent across the university um, and you know so it's it, it's going through a vetting process to make sure that the language is on the one hand consistent across the university but on the other hand uh, uh, directs people to relevant Rutgers Newark offices rather than offices in Camden or uh, New Brunswick so, um, so that, that, that will be coming out uh, very soon. Perfect. Thank you very much. Amber, I'd like to bring you back to the stage. Uh, we have a question about, from a faculty member who says they are interested in using a transparent mask during teaching. They're wondering if this is an option for us. We are uh, working on um, procuring and ordering a number of masks that we can make available to faculty in teaching, and we'll be working with the dean's offices to get those masks to them so they can share them with the department chairs and faculty. Clear masks, to be clear, transparent masks. Thank you, thank you. And Sharianne, I'm gonna bring you back to the floor, please. As we're speaking about the buildings, will there be a security presence walking around in the campus and the buildings once we repopulate? Absolutely. Um, thanks for that question, Candace. So one of the things, one of the groups who never left was public safety. Um, and so we've had, God bless them, um, both security have been here and the police have been here um, the entire time. And so based, uh, what uh, Amber talks about in terms of regular uh, operating hours, we'll also go back to uh, uh, regular patrols. So for each building, there have been people who both security go through buildings, um, RUPD also walks and drives around campus. Um, and I, I do want to also re reiterate things like that were in existence before COVID. If you see something, say something. Um, and so, you know, please don't hesitate to call for security. If, you, if something warrants it, do not call them if someone doesn't have a mask on. That is not warranted. Um, as uh, Tony talked about, there is a reporting system. And I will say this, which keeps all of us on our toes. In that reporting system is the ability to take a picture of someone unmasked and to upload that into the system. And so, I would recommend that everybody walk around with their mask, like on the wrist, if you think you take it off and you put it back on. So I constantly have mine on, um, but the security is, it is important and they will absolutely be here. We also hope to reinstate our CSO program. The students weren't here. So that program 
hadn't been um, really functioning, but I know unless Tony tells me otherwise, that's coming back as well. Um, and along with that, I also do want to encourage everyone to have your ID on your person as you go around campus. You don't necessarily have to have it on you, hanging by your neck, though it's the easiest, that way you don't forget it, but please to make sure I have it on you. There will be buildings that, a couple buildings that will have more, um, that will have security that didn't have pre-COVID. And so Blumenthal and Englehart will have folks um, at the door for the fall semester. And really just to sort of control um, traffic and the like. But we really, as we said, want to keep everyone safe and um, make sure when we're not in the academic environment that folks are socially distancing appropriately. And so the security is just also here, just keep us safe as they normally would. So I hope that answers that question. Thank you very much. I'll keep you right here. We have a question specifically about the computer lab on the Newark campus. Uh, the, the employees that I manage the computer lab on the Newark campus and we host classes in those labs. Are the same classroom protocols to be followed in the computer labs? Absolutely. So classroom protocols it, are for all, um, as Tony mentioned, in all academic environments. So we're talking about classrooms, computer labs, libraries, I'm saying ease because we have a library in the law school. We have libraries, in, you know, in other spaces. Plus Dana, which is so beautiful. I really need you all to go look at the third floor. It's gorgeous. Um, a wonderful job by our IPNO staff on that on that um, facility. Um, Paul Robeson Campus Center. All of those spaces that are, are are congregate spaces. All the rules apply, right? So there's no social distancing, but the masks have to be worn. We do want people to, you know, to be be respectful of each other's space and boundaries whenever possible. We know that's hard. I'm thinking about when, you know, everybody wants to go to Starbucks right during free period. Oh, Starbucks will be open. It was. We got questions on that as well. Um, both one wash and 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 PRCC. Um, and so, just really want people to be really careful and mindful about their surroundings and how they interact with each other. But all the rules apply for whether you're in the computer lab, libraries, and the like. Um, and so, and that applies to, to all employees and fact, you know, so faculty and staff, someone might tell us, you know, advise you might move a little further to the left that they feel uncomfortable and that's just fine. Um, folks are just doing what makes them feel most comfortable. Thank you, thank you. We continue to get questions in the chat and a lot of the questions that are being asked now, these were addressed when Tony opened with his opening remarks. This entire session is being recorded and it will be available. So everyone will get the answers to their questions. We do have a few more questions that I wanna um, make sure we cover. So jumping right in. Tony, I think maybe this one, you have the, the expertise to address this one for us. I'll put you back in. Oh, because it's, um, okay, got it, there we go. How are unvaccinated employees being identified and who notifies them of the need to test weekly? Who notifies them, I'm sorry, Candace, on? Sure, who notifies our unvaccinated employees of the need to get tested weekly? I know it's okay. once or twice a week. So interesting because I was going to jump in here before this ended because that was a piece that I uh, inadvertently left out. Okay, so um, employees who have not uploaded their vaccination card last week received their first email telling them that they have now been automatically um, placed into the required testing protocol. What happens is that occupational health will communicate on a weekly basis with employees via email, reminding them that they need to go and get tested. The supervisor is not involved in any way, shape or form. We do not wanna put that, uh, the onus on the supervisor. We don't want supervisors and managers chasing employees about testing. That is not their responsibility to do. I believe it puts them in a very awkward position no one wants to be the testing police of another employee, and it's up against what I would consider to be privacy concerns. Not a HIPAA concern, but it's a privacy concern. So we wanted to remove that completely. We've managed to do that. Employees will get this email. The email actually went out about, uh, again, this week, maybe about 30 minutes ago. Um, It'll go to their inbox. It'll tell them what they need to do, instructions. If employees feel that they can waive out of testing, 
there is an ability to fill out a form for it to be reviewed and then uh, they will be notified. Once they upload a card or they are compliant, they no longer will get the, uh, with the testing pro protocol, they'll no longer get that um, email. So again, we do not want supervisors and managers to concern themselves with the testing protocols at all. It will be handled as a central function. Thank you very much, thank you. Are there any considerations being given to reintroducing surveillance testing for a student who live on campus? Yes, there are. So we continue to look at um, we continue to look at the testing program as a whole. We we need to understand a, a couple of different things, right? So the CDC does not, and and public health again says that um, vaccinated individuals should not undergo uh, surveillance testing. We continue to follow that and see where that leads us as as COVID unfolds. For students, we uh, the intention is that we will have random testing to make sure that we don't have some outbreak we have not caught up to in a residence hall. That kind of congregate living very different than the type of living that our that our faculty and our staff do. And and again, we have a responsibility there that's a little bit different than a responsibility that we have with faculty and staff. Not to say they're not as important. We'll follow the science. We'll follow the guidelines. Um, and we'll continue to make decisions based on what COVID literally tells us. Thank you, thank you. I have a question here that I'm seeing variations of it in the live chat that I wanna to present to you now, please. If a student discloses to a faculty or staff member that they have tested positive for COVID, they have disclosed this voluntarily, what directions can we provide to these students? So, a student should not be in class to be able to um, actually volunteer that information to a faculty member. So a student, um, once it's discovered they're positive, will be quarantined um, or isolated, depending as to where, where, where in the process it is. We have spaces available to be able to do that. We have protocols in place to be able to support those students. Should never really wind up in class. Now, if a student is positive and happens to go to class, the, the, our whole system of contact tracing kicks in, determining how close contact there was, where it was, how long it was for, all those types of um, public health uh, guidelines come into play. And then um, faculty members would be, would be notified if indeed there is a reason to do that. Now, on the flip side, if a student is out, we, we ask, and I think maybe Ashwangi, Ashwani can help me here, um, if there's assignments that need to be made up, handled like any other illness, um, I assume. Um, from from a faculty member, whatever other help a student would need. Am I correct in that, Ashwani? Uh, that's right. I mean, if there's, you know, students have uh, medical issues or other issues all the time and faculty work with them and the same protocols would apply in this case as well. But you're right. If, if, you're, if a student is COVID positive, they should not be in the classroom uh, in the first place. And if they happen to be, then our contact Tracing procedures will be in place. Thanks, Tony. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, on that same topic, we have questions about leniencies with attendance policies. Do faculty have the ability to be lenient with the attendance policies? So that one I know is not me. <laughs> so I would I would have the same answer that we you know that I just gave, which is faculty do make accommodations as needed. It can be, you know, a blanket. You know, it's it's like any other situation, where if a student has a specific issue, it doesn't even have to be medical. Then they work with faculty, and or if there is something specific, then they may work through disability services. Uh, but it's the same protocols that will be in place. There's nothing unique for COVID that we have uh, for our classes. Does that answer the question, Candice? I believe it does. Thank you very much. Thanks. Will students, faculty, and staff be required to continue to complete the campus pass daily? And if yes, how is the university going to ensure that these are occurring daily? So this, this is part of our shared responsibility. The, the university, um, for privacy reasons, again, does not track uh, what 
the my pass uh, what happens with my pass my pass is built out so that an individual can do a double check as to how they are feeling on any given day it's kind of interesting how sometimes you know those four or five questions trigger something and all of a sudden you realize well wait a minute maybe 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 i should not be going in today right but this is not this all of a sudden feels like it's not the allergy that i normally have um so and, and honestly my pass is a very personal tool to help an individual we do require that it be used because we want you to understand if you're feeling well or not feeling well on any given day but it's to help the individual and while it helps the individual it helps the university of course because you're not coming in if there is something that is wrong but more importantly helps your family and your friends where you're coming from because you want to protect them too and protect them as well thank you very much thank you so the return to Rutgers guide is asking us to wipe down the surfaces after we use them who will be responsible for wiping those surfaces down in the classroom? And will those supplies be available for students? So I believe that that has now uh, been removed. So again, following the science, um, there was uh, updated um, information that came out of the CDC and public health guidance that talked to hygiene theater. So um, the this virus is aerosolized and it's centrally, it's essentially uh, the contaminants are in the air and bring, breathing them in, does not necessarily translate into being attached to a hard surface. And so the science now shows that that is not the case. So that has been removed from the guidance that we have put out. Um, we're no longer asking people to do that on a regular basis. Of course, in, in common areas, classroom areas, we have custodians that will be doing that work. They'll be getting into classrooms more than once daily, on a more frequent basis. Those schedules are up on the website as well. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm trying to squeeze in as many questions as we can. But will there be any consideration to requiring our visitors to campus to be vaccinated? Not presently, no, we are no, not requiring, again, we're not requiring for the, the vast majority of our faculty and staff, so certainly will not require uh, our visitors, uh, at, at least at this point. Again, we follow the science. In February of last year, we never thought we'd be going home for a year and a half in March. So we will continue to follow that science to make uh, those determinations. Thank you very much. Uh, just your opening um, remarks covered a lot of our questions, so, and there's lots of duplicates in the chat. This is recorded again, so all of the information will be available. We'll distribute the recorded version, and we're also documenting all of the questions in the chat here in the hopes that we can respond to everyone um, as soon as we can. Sherry Ann. Oh, this, this Closing is remarks for us. I like you. Minutes. <laughs> like, I thought you had another question for me. So, again, we just want to thank you all for coming. We know that, as Candace just said, a lot of you um, still have some questions. I've been looking at the chat on my other screen, the QA, and we will try to get back to you with responses that weren't answered today and put up a FAQ. I know the university has one. We will also do some Newark specific ones. We've already talked about that and changed the leadership team. So, please don't think if you didn't get your question answered today that it won't get answered because it will. Um, and with that, I just do want to thank Tony so much for laying out so much important information, our colleagues for, for doing this work. And I also want to say that we are so appreciative, appreciative for all of you who've been hard at work. So we are going to have an end of September, I think we're talking about Candace, based on dates and availability of, of uh, tokens, that uh, we we're going to have a welcome back um, celebration for our faculty and staff students we love you but you have a week of welcome all to yourselves um that you will get to celebrate and so this this event that i'm talking about is for faculty and staff um and at that event we're actually going to do a special acknowledgement recognition for our our staff who never left right so we're talking about everyone from security to maintenance to custodians to doug our mail carrier right i mean the ways in which you all 
have kept this institution running. Not saying those of us who got to, you know, telecommute didn't, but it's really different when you don't have the option to go home. Um, these are people who also have been working, who also have children, who also have um, other kinds of elder care, health issues. And so we just really want to use that um, event to, to, to put a special a spotlight on, on those of you who, who've done that work for us. Um, and so we'll put a date out. I, we're just holding because we want to make sure that, again, there will be a little token um, and it'll be little because we still have other big bills we have to pay for. But um, just really to acknowledge the amazing work that you all have done and how much we're happy to, to see each other. Um, it will be outside um, um, and we know it'll be in the tennis court. So we have a location. We're just waiting on the day and time. We're also going to make it at a time that we you know we have multiple shifts of people. We have the folks who get off at one, folks who start at three. And so we'll we'll make sure that we bridge those two time slots. So again, you know, can't say enough how much we really appreciate and value all of you, faculty, staff, students, um, administrators. We know them as Tony said. Not that we wanted you to suffer, but a lot of people haven't been sleeping, um, and we just really want to celebrate each other that we're that we're all still here together. And I do I can't. Be, I'd be remiss, Tony already said it, but I want to remind folks, particularly our faculty and staff and students, students have student health, faculty and staff, the mental health resources that UHR have put up, please, please, please take a look at them, go through them. You're going to hear us say it the entire fall semester, if not year. There's some really good things between, you know, therapeutic things, yoga, um, just a mental health day, a wellness moment. Um, you know, getting, leaving your office to have lunch, just the ways in which we really want you all to help take care of yourselves and each other. And so with that, Candice, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Just going to close with reminding everyone again, this session has been recorded. We will be sharing this with everyone. So you'll be able to um, take a moment to review them. All of the questions that are in chat, we're documenting them and we will be following up with answers for all of these. Thank you all, be safe and be well, and look forward to meeting you all on campus. Bye. Bye folks, take care.